It's been a little more than a month now since the announcement of a new pope, and many people are still wondering exactly how it happened and how it happened so quickly. We're here today with Stacy Mike Tree from the Wall Street Journal Rome Bureau. Ciao, Stacy. Hi there. So, um, Stacy, um, you and your colleague Alessandra Galoni have produced this incredible ebook that the Wall Street Journal is publishing next week, and we're fortunate to have an excerpt of it in Weekend Review this weekend. I wanted to go through some of the incredible scenes here. So, tell us a little bit about um, what it was like when then Cardinal Bergoglio arrived in Rome for the conclave, because he really wasn't thought to be a big player, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and if I could just add that um, we, we, we produced the ebook with, uh, with incredible reporting from our colleagues in Latin America as well. Of course. Um, but but you know, me and Alessandro, we focused on the, on the Rome section of the book. And yes, in that case, um, we were focusing on the, the rise of Bergoglio, the candidate. And, and so um, he, he arrives in Rome, and while all of the big-name candidates, the people whose names are being brewed about in the press, are going to fancy dinners and moving around in motorcades, what, what was his daily life like there in the first days of the gathering? Well, he was, uh, he was a much more modest figure within the college. Um, he was known because in 2005 he drew some votes in that conclave, the one that elected uh, Benedict XVI. But uh, he was staying in a part of Rome, you know, uh, across the Tiber, away from the Vatican City, at a sort of hotel for priests. And, and staying at this hotel, it really sort of, you know, um, puts you in touch with the city. You know, when he walks uh, every day to the general congregation where, the, where they were having these secret pre-conclave meetings, you know, he's walking through the square, he's blending in with the people. Um, and, and, you know, in terms of the way he dressed, I mean, he wasn't in the, you know, the classic crimson vestments of, of a cardinal. I mean, he, he walked around with a dark, a dark overcoat on and, and really kept a low profile. Right, and, and bareheaded too, so he, he really <laughs> looks like he's just another pedestrian. Exactly. So, so things began to get more serious as the conclave um, went into um, second and third days, and, and you, you give us these wonderful scenes of the behind closed doors politicking. The conclave, for all of its, its secrecy, once you get inside the room, inside the Sistine Chapel, it's basically, you know, it's, it's a ceremony. So a lot of the politicking goes on beforehand. And, and you know, these dinners um, that were happening at night, they were confidential. They were sort of regarded as, you know, the conclave within the conclave. And this one dinner that, that we described in the book, of course, it took place at the Pontifical North American College, and this is a, a seminary that's on a hill above the Vatican. Um, and, uh, and it involved basically, you know, a number of cardinals from the English-speaking world. Uh, you know, they arrived there under the cover of night, um, and they, um, you know, they, they, they met and dined within the so-called Red Room, which is named after a, a famous Vatican drawing room where cardinals historically used to, you know, wait to see whether or not they'd be named a cardinal. And so they all were inside this, this room and they were, they were dropping names and basically, basically testing candidacies. And so um, Bergoglio's name, Cardinal Bergoglio's name, doesn't seem to have been in their conversations at first, but, um, but, but his name did come up later, and he was, he was taken much more seriously um, by everyone, it seems, after he gave this very short speech, four minutes, that seemed to have transformed his status. So, so can you tell us about the, the context for that? Yeah. I mean, starting with the, the dinner a couple nights beforehand, his name was dropped. It didn't generate a lot of buzz. They moved on to discussing higher profile candidates. But then he gives this speech two days later. Um, that really sort of ignites the, the general congregation. I think he, he really turned some heads in that meeting. Um, and, and the speech was short, like you said, it was four minutes, but it really um, addressed the elephant in the room, which, is, which was um, the fact that the church is, you know, struggling uh, to attract followers. I mean, not only in Europe, um, where the struggle has been going on for decades, but they're also facing struggles in Latin America. And what he was saying basically is we have to stop navel, navel gazing. We have to stop this sort of quote unquote spiritual narcissism, um, which has us constantly looking inward. And instead, we've got to look outward. We've got to, you know, start doing the, the, the outreach, the things that were part of the core message of the gospel, if you will. And, and this, this seems to have brought together 
votes, uh, support from different factions within the College of Cardinals. Can, can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. You know, obviously there were a, a group of, of cardinals that supported him back in 2005, but I think the key thing here is that he started to attract some of the more, shall we say, you know, conservative votes, um, people who you wouldn't typically think would vote for a Jesuit pope. Um, and these are men like, uh, you know, Cipri Cardinal Cipriani Thorne of, of Lima. Um, you know, th this is a guy, for example, who, you know, has been a very stern critic of, of liberation theology. And, you know, any rhetoric that, you know, would invite class warfare, um, you know, he would have been very attentive to that. And I think the reason Bergoglio was, was so effective in his speech is that he managed to, to somehow, you know, walk a delicate line. He was saying we need to be out there helping the poor, but he wasn't saying, you know, we need to go after the rich. Very good. Stacy Maitri, thanks for joining us from Rome. You're welcome. And uh, we look forward to uh, reading more in the ebook, which comes out this week from the Wall Street Journal. For Wall Street Journal Weekend Review, I'm Gary Rosen.